Today we have Welsh international, um, 39 caps, over 500 league appearances, two Welsh Cup, two Welsh League Cup winning medals. Lots I of didn't know that. Lots of experience. Uh, FA Wales technical director. Welcome, Ace. How's things? You forgot housemate of HMP Press Guide and HMP Wandsworth. Introduce me properly, Scott. You know what I mean? Don't don't leave me anything out of the CV, mate. <laughs> oh dear, no. Uh, we did we did discuss that. No, it's look. We'll, we'll discuss obviously yeah, no in detail afterwards. But um, good to speak to you. Always enjoyed. Number one, always enjoyed playing against you. You probably didn't remember the, the chirpy little twenty-year-old that um, <laughs> first came up against you playing against Cam Brown for New Sound, and then obviously coming up against your sides. I did always enjoy coming up against you because one, such an experienced person and player. A um, lot of my teammates didn't know who you were until we discussed who you were in the dressing room afterwards, and I said, look. If you're talking about real footballers, this 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 is a real footballer, you know. And they were going, it was giving me loads of stick on the side. I said, yeah, no, because he's full of experience and he's, you know, that's that's what they do. That that is the the old yeah. way and everything. So, um, welcome. It's good to discuss football as, yeah. as we will do. But going all the way back to your Newport days and um, your early influences in football, um, what made you get into football? It, it... From an early age, to be fair, growing up in Newport, uh, you know, you're talking, you know, early 60s, really. I was born in 1959. Not a lot going on. Uh, my brother was eight years older than me. He's, he's, he's passed away now, God rest his soul. But uh, but he was he was uh, an aspiring footballer. You know, he, he'd represented Wales at all levels right up to under 23s. He was a pro at Newport. He ended up playing, you know, 20 odd years himself. Uh, played for Newport, Swindon and Portsmouth. Yeah. So whilst there was no sport historically in my family, I don't know where it came from, but both me and my brother became professional footballers. So it was always something that I wanted to do or attempt to do to, to emulate my big brother because he was my hero. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, I just want to be like him. And so I spent every working hour uh, the only thing I couldn't, I, you know, and so, you know, I, I could put the ball you know, in the height of my career on a sixpence, I could pass it, I could control it. The only thing I couldn't do was I couldn't run very fast. <laughs> but I couldn't do a lot about that because when you, when, you, when you get a little bit older and you look into the science of it, there's not a lot you can do about that. There's only one person who decides if you're going to be quick or not, and that's God in, your, in how your makeup. You can change 10% of your slow twitch and fast twitch fibres, but that's it. So God decided that I wasn't going to be quick but he gave me other attributes, which, which, I, which I was blessed with. It's funny you should say that. Did you see the game last night, Germany and France? Yeah. Did you see Matt's, uh, Matt's Hummel when yeah. uh, Mappe ran past him? And the commentators yeah. were saying, oh, I, I, just, I, didn't go there. I just feel sorry. I've been in that situation, mate. I was, I was once, I was, I was playing for, I think it was Charlton. So I, I was still late 20s. But, you know, you're either quick or you're not. And we were playing away at Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, and we had a corner, and I, I, I had a habit when I went up for corners. Everywhere I went, the ball went somewhere, went somewhere else. So eventually, the manager said, "Look, stay back on the halfway line because you never get near the ball." Anyway, so I'm back on the halfway line. And we got a corner against Sheffield Wednesday at Hillsborough, and you know the big stand at Hillsborough is massive on the, the the thing. And what happened was, they broke, and Trevor Francis, who was quick, yeah was coming towards me and I'm on the halfway and I've got 60 yards behind me, right? And I know instantly I'm in trouble because I can't turn and chase him because I won't catch him. So he knew as well. He thought, there's this fat guy on the halfway line. I'm just going to kick it behind him and run. I don't have to have, I don't have to do a leg over. I don't have to do no tricks, no nothing. I just kick it and run. So <laughs> he booted the ball past me and literally booted it past me and started to run. And I thought, what can I do? So I rugby tackled him. <laughs> I, I rugby tackled him on the halfway line. I've never seen anything in my life like it. The crowd just laughed. The crowd just laughed. And Trevor Francis went, what are you doing? I went, what do you want me to do? Did you I'm get a booking? Oh, yeah, only, only a booking. Only a booking. But yeah. like I said, going back to that, you, you, you got what you got. And what I, what I did, Scott, for my... Uh, and people say, you know, are oh, you lucky to be... A, you know yourself. Listen, 
football is a sacrifice. To be a footballer, you sacrifice an awful lot in your life. When all my mates in Newport were going out with girls and boozing and this, that and the other, I'm training. I'm training, you know what I mean? And, and so, okay, you had the benefits later on. And it's, a, it's about sacrifice. And I gave up an awful lot to be a footballer. I, I had to keep myself, because I wasn't quick, I had to keep myself when I was playing at about a stone under my natural weight in order to be able to run as slow in the 90th minute as I ran in the first minute. And that was a key. I could run forever, but I couldn't run very fast. And so that was, that, and so that was a sacrifice, you know, that, that you make, but you wouldn't change it for a world, mate. Talking about your lack of pace and stuff, you must have had something because I've just reeled off, you know, the teams you play for, Newport. Luton, Charlton, Leeds, Bradford, Bristol, Cardiff. You know, you don't play for those teams and your national team if you haven't got other attributes. You know, you could play, you could organise, you're a leader. Um, you know, you're probably captain of a lot of those teams as well. So Yeah, every team I played for, I was captain of, you know. Uh, and so other people, it's up, for, it's up to other people really to say what are the qualities you had. But uh, what I would say is if I was fit, I always got picked because I could... I could influence others on the pitch. I didn't always, I didn't always have to play well myself to influence the result, uh, and that was just understanding. I spent a lot of time, you know, if if you're not quick, uh, uh, but I managed to play 39 times for my country. So I I studied defending, uh, and I studied how to defend and where to stand and how to stop people. Uh, sometimes not always by the letter of the law, but that's life. That's life. My job was to. Uh, if I was to sum up at the top level, at a lower level, I, was, I could play. But at the top level, I couldn't play, but I could stop those who thought they could. And that was, that was, that's, that's a strength in itself. And for me, even now watching the Euros and watching the game develop over the last 20 years or whatever, pure defending is a, is a dying art. I saw the goal that Wales conceded and, and it struck me with horror, you know, that the lad, I think it was Roberts, the right back, uh, the ball's literally gone past his left ear as the guy edges it, but he can't see the ball because he's not even facing the ball. And I'm and and I would, I think to myself, just defend, just head the ball. Yeah. You know, there, there, there's a fact when I worked for UEFA, I think in in uh, they analysed, I think it was five thousand uh, matches at all levels, and from a corner, if the defending side got the first touch, it was less than one percent of times a goal resulted. So the key to it is not grabbing all over your hands all over other people to stop them heading it. Head the ball yourself. Yeah. Get a touch on it. You know, and 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 dying, it, it's a dying art defending, mate. The, the, the modern game, and we'll go on to that later, but I'm sure the modern game for me is now it's it's what I call an intercepting game. There's no tackles, you intercept the ball. And people start taking false positions because they stand next to people, they don't mark them, they stand next to them, and it's a 50-50 interception game. And if you're in the box as a striker, 50-50 is good odds, mate, for a striker. They'll take that all day long. And I see people standing in, in spaces rather than marking men, uh, and it lands on their head and he heads it away. And that happened 10 times in a game, but it's only got to happen once when he misses you and he scores. So defending, to me, is a dying art, proper defending. It is, and there's so much diving and play-acting and time-wasting and you know, you look back to obviously when when you played at your height, it was yes, it was worse pitches, condition of players, but technically, you know, the, the game has sort of it's moved on with this they're more powerful like like Ronaldo's and things like that. But is it as good as is it as good to watch as it was back sixties, seventies, eighties? That's up for debate, anybody. Anyway, well, somebody asked me last week, would George Best have been able to play in a modern game? And I just laughed. I said, do you know what he had to put up with, George Best? He was still absolutely amazing. Imagine him in the modern day game where there's no tackling. Yeah. He'd make Messi look like a mug, let me tell you. So, you know, and yes, the game has moved on in terms of, uh, they say it's moved on, you know, but people in my generation played 60 games a year. They tell me now that with all this, cryotherapy with all these recovery protocols with all this with all this periodization training programs blah, blah, blah. but they need a rest i can't i can't sometimes get my head around it because 
when I was playing, if I was fit, I wanted to play. The manager had said to me, I'm going to leave you out because you, you've got too many red blood cells and bad. Shut up. Was you know what I mean? One or two subs at the time or three subs at maximum. So, you know, it wasn't a squad game back then, was it? You look at how no, yeah, they were. 16 or 17 in your first team. You have 30 players. Yeah. And, you know, you if you didn't play, if you if you were if you were a, you know a first team regular, if you didn't play, it was because you're injured or suspended, not because uh, we we we've done your blood test and your your red blood cells say this 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 and this. I agree with with so much, and I and I've just revalidated my pro license, and I and I sit there and I and you know it, it's fantastic system. You know, I was part and parcel of setting that up with a lad called Kevin Calwell, all that uh, when I got the accreditation. But I sit there and a lot of these people live in this, what I call this fluffy cloud world. Yeah. Uh, and they talk about, you know, we had a big lecture on periodization of training. I'm, I feel I felt I stand up and saying, yeah, but I've got blokes who just come off scaffolding all day and we train on a Wednesday and we got to play on a Saturday. Put together a periodization training program for me. That's that's the real world where vast majority of coaches work. You were you were you were lucky or were you unlucky? I don't know. Time will tell in terms of your first management job was with TNS. And I remember uh, not a discussion. I think it was more of an argument with Craig. Yeah, Craig Harrison. I think because uh, what I used to do, I just used to mess with people's heads when, when we played TNS and just and I think we played them once at Port Harbor. But you might have even actually been playing in a game. Yeah. And I remember Tame taking a team talk before the game. And I said to all the players, during the first half, if any of you go over the halfway line, I'm going to find your week's wages. Oh, we remember, we talk about it. We talk about it because... And I and they went, I went, no, I'm serious. You get the ball, I said, and if we get a free kick, you kick her in the corner, you stay where you are. And they looked at me and I just thought, well, what's the point? There's, there's no point, right? And, and I remember Craig saying, and we, I think we got a nil-nil draw. We missed a chance at the end to win it, which was being a freak from a corner. Uh, and I remember... Craig saying to me afterwards, that's a disgrace, that. And I remember saying to him at the time, Craig, there'll come a time in your career when you haven't got all the best players and the biggest budget. And let's see what your philosophy is then. He went, my philosophy will never change, never change, blah, blah, blah. Now I get on okay with Craig, so if he watches this, he'll understand. And then I remember that it was like a year or so, it might be a couple of years later, and he went to Hartlepool. Now he's no longer got the best players or the biggest budget. And I saw the goalkeeper get the ball in his hands and everybody run to the halfway line and they all squeezed up and he kicked it long. And I'm thinking, hang about a minute. Where's, where's the philosophy? So it happens. And, and so with yourself, is it a good thing that your first job was TNS? I don't know. Time will tell on that. But when you haven't got all the best resources and all the best players, you have to, because they say to you on coaching courses, you've got to get a philosophy. And I, I always say, yeah, but my philosophy is I have a corporate responsibility to the people who are paying me to win matches. So philosophy is great, but I have to change it sometimes and do whatever's necessary to win games. I agree with you 100%. You can only, you can only use that philosophy with it if you've got the right players. And people talk about formations. It's about the players. You can only work with the player and put them in the right positions against the opposition. It's, it's very simple, isn't it? But yeah, and I, I remember having a chat with Oshin. Oshin and Oshin said, well, you've got to trust your players. I said, well, what if they're crap? It's all I can afford. I can't trust them. So I have to tell them what to do. Yeah. And this is what I'm on about is sometimes it's a fluffy cloud world in people's philosophy, yeah. but the real world is slightly different. And coming down to the leisure centre there and uh, man for man, remember, you, you had a couple of decent games against man for man. And then there's a couple, I think, Probably a six. Was there a six? I think yeah. Stan Finley was running through. But they, they were the types of things that... And you... this is what I'm on about. I say, I, me I remember the game. You know, we cut the man to man and we, we surprised Craig. And I, I remember Harrison one time dribbling the ball all the way out and getting like 20 yards inside the half and thinking, what do I do? Because everybody just stayed with everybody else. But then that only goes so far, then the surprise element's gone. And then what happens was, it's, it's simple to defeat it. Yeah, you get Draper comes really short, or well, he brings the centre-half in, and the midfield player sets off, and we've got beat five. But then I'm saying to the centre-half, hang about him and make a decision, stay in your hole. Well, you told me to stay with him. And that's what I'm on about. You can't trust the players. If they're not good, they're not good enough. Yeah. 
but you just, you know, you just mess with people. <laughs> I remember one time coming to TNS and, and deliberately telling a kit man to forget the kit. You know what I mean? And we had to play in your kit, I think, one time. Yes, yeah. 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 <laughs> so but, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever you can use to your advantage, absolutely. It is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. And I used to say it's a, it's a leisure centre pitch. Mike Harris built a leisure centre, not a football stadium, because it was a leisure centre pitch till they changed it. It was rock hard, like playing on the road. But then you know? we would come to Kamar and we would leave the grass long. We'd be like, geez, what's going on here now? Exactly. <laughs> You know, straight away. Oh, what's what? I said, no, my fault. The, the groundsman's part time. It rained. He couldn't cut the pitch. You know what I mean? <laughs> and to be fair, but, yeah, it's what it is. It's all, it's all part and parcel of the game, mate. And it's all part of just, you know, you have to try and take any advantage. It works sometimes. I think we had a good record against TNS, one of the best, I think. And other times we got hammered. But that's life. Always enjoyed. There's, I think it was, it was Dwayne. Remember Dwayne Courtney, the right back? Um, yeah, yeah, he's used to. <laughs> he, was, he was going, he's always hammering me. He's always on my case. He said, he's even said, come back to my house and you, you can use my pole if you want to. <laughs> and I said, look, look just yeah. go on, try and, know, yeah. and keep him out. I said, look, come back to my place for a swim, mate. You yeah. know what I mean? But the last, uh, they, like you say, they didn't have a clue who I was, which is no. fine, a different generation to me. But, but they did have to because I told them, look, look, he's, he's been decent, don't. You know, don't, don't be getting too much. He, just respect what he's got to say. Have a laugh and get on with it. But you did. You could get into people's heads. And that's what you've got to do, you know, um, yeah. on that touchline. And I enjoyed it. I remember, I don't know whether you remember, when you played for Cambrian at Newtown, I think it was probably one of my first games. And um, you were just giving me loads of stick. And I wasn't even marking against you. I wasn't even <laughs> against you. And, and then I think I scored in the game. And I was like, who's it was, it was this lad? It it's a coin. He said, it's Mark Hazelwood, you know. You know, he's, he's, he's played, he's a good level. And then second half, I shot. But I did score against you. And yeah. it was one of them where, you know, respect. I, I think it was Ken up front in them. There's one of Ken McKenna, who liked to have a bit of a tussle. Yeah, Kenny as well. So, yeah. Look, if we go back to Newport, you made your yeah. debut at Newport, 16 years of age. You're still at school at the time as well, maybe? Yeah, I was. What, what happened was, I think the manager was Jimmy Schooler. Newport were... In them days, you had to apply for the younger the younger people who watch this. You had to apply for re-election to the league if you finished in the bottom, if you finished bottom of Division Two as it is now. And so the other clubs voted whether they wanted you to stay in the league. There was no automatic. Yeah. So Newport were finishing bottom every year because they were just you know, they're just useless. But they always got voted back in because it was easy to get to on the M4. Uh, that was fact. And so I, I remember Jimmy Schooler saying to me, "We're playing Darlington away." And uh, on the Saturday, and we had to travel on a Friday afternoon by train. And for about two weeks before it, you won't remember this, you're too young, uh, with personal washing powder in the in way back, you used to get travel vouchers. If you, so everybody was told to tell their missus, their mother, their aunties, you had to buy personal for the next two weeks to get the travel vouchers. So we got free train tickets. Now, I remember I had to ask my headmaster for a Friday afternoon off because we were traveling up overnight and my headmaster said no uh you, you know you 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 pie in the sky you have a dream of being a footballer it's not gonna happen your education more important anyway cut a long story short my father was was a steel worker quite tough lad uh and he went to see the headmaster and miraculously the headmaster said yeah that's okay you can go uh yeah, I'll, I'll leave it up to you what my father yeah, did. Yeah, what, what I think he actually threatened him. So anyway, so we get on a, we meet up at Newport Station and I go to sit down and Jimmy Schooler and there was a couple of older pros there who went, what are you doing? I went, I'm taking my seat. I said, I've got loads of vouchers, my aunties, my sisters, my back. No, 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 no. We haven't got enough. We had a squad of, I think it was 14, 15 people with a, the manager and we only had 14 tickets. And because I was 16, they said, you have to walk up and down the train. And if you see the, the ticket guard come in, jump in the toilet. So <laughs> it's a true story. I walked all the way to crew and we changed at crew. And I think we got summer and we went on to Darling. And oh, my God, that was my first experience of professional football. Cool. Scabbing a, 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 what do you call it, a breaking the law on a train. I didn't know that I'd be breaking the law about 35 years later or whatever. <laughs> but at that time, I was ordered to do that. Yeah. 
So no, that, that was my that was my that was my start in Newport, an inauspicious start, I think you call it. Uh, and I managed to play. I was lucky. I managed to play thirty nine. I think I played them a couple of games, and then it was like a preseason. And then what happened the, the, the next time I was in the squad? We were playing Northampton away, and again we had an old secretary there, and modern day players won't recognise these type of things. We were travelling up on a National Express coach. Uh, and the old secretary kept the club going for years by not paying any bills. So he'd, he'd book a pre-match in a hotel, send a bill, he'd never pay it. So we were driving around Northampton, I remember it, and Jimmy Schooler was manager and he was going mental. Where's it? We were looking for the Warwick Castle Hotel, yeah? And uh, so in the end, Jimmy Schooler rang the secretary and said, where the f- is the Warwick Castle Hotel? And the secretary said, it's not the Warwick Castle Hotel. The only place in that area where I could get a meal where we don't owe money is Warwick Castle itself. So we had a pre-match meal in this banquet in all in Warwick Castle, yeah? With all Chinese people taking pictures and all this. And I'm thinking, so I've got a train. Now I'm in Warwick Castle. What is all this professional football about? I nearly thought to myself, I'd go back to school, but I thought, nah, 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 nah. And so uh, what happened was I was sub. And... I'd never played centre half in, in all my junior football. And the centre half done his hammy after about 30 seconds. And Jimmy School turned to me and went, Do you want to go on as centre half? I went, Yeah, yeah, of course I will. Of course I'll go on. I went on and I ended up playing the next 39 games after that, stayed on. And that's how it started. And I got transferred to Luton. Yeah. Uh, I think I was David Pleat's first ever signing. I think, you know, David Pleat, I think you paid 50 grand for me at 18 and went to Luton. So I was lucky because you can get stuck at a club like Newport uh, and maybe your career won't develop. But I got out of there after 39 games. Playing at centre-half in a, in a back I four. Centre-half, left-back, yeah. Centre-half, yeah. stroke, left-back. Somebody else yeah. alongside you, experienced as well? Yeah, I had a fellow called Don Murray when I played for Newport uh, who'd, who'd been a... He'd been like a 20-year pro for Cardiff or wherever. So so he, he taught me a few things, you know, and a... And a, and a fellow in midfield called Brian Godfrey, I remember him well, uh, who had been a player, been a proper player, been at Villa and stuff like that. He was now an old man. But, you know, they were experienced pros. And I always took that on board because whenever I was then an experienced pro, pro in a club, I remembered the help that I got from these guys. And I always tried to, yeah. to help the young, younger ones, you know? Yeah. So Luton, another good spell there. Before Luton, we won the championship. Yeah. The first season I went there, we had to win the last game at home. Cambridge United to stay up. Yeah. We did that. It was David Pleat's first professional uh, management role. Uh, but he was fantastic. What a, he was, he yeah. was what they called in M. Day Scott, a tracksuit manager. Yeah. Every single day he took training himself personally. Yeah. And it'll surprise you because because it's it's the norm now, but he was. Uh, innovative in his time. He was the first coach manager to play a right footer on the left wing and a left footer on the right wing and come in and bounce balls off centre forwards and back. It was innovative in them days, never been seen before. And David Pleat was an absolute fantastic coach. Bit of a weirdo at times. Uh, yeah, a bit strange. Yeah. A bit strange, but he was, he, he, he he's a, as, even to this day, when you hear him on the radio, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of footballers. Yes. And way back then, he had it as well. He knew every footballer. He also knew every racehorse and the distance he'd like to travel and what where he'd best run and did it go on a right-hand track or a left-hand track. Right. So, you know, so he had an encyclopedic knowledge about many things. But in terms of football coaching, I couldn't have wished for a better start to my career than to, to be under him for, I think I was there three and a half years. Worked with you individually, major. Yeah, you know, uh, sort of in in the days when uh, you know individual training programs were never heard of. Everybody went in and squad trained from ten till about one o'clock, and he went home. You know, he we were having food at the ground, which which is standard now. But in them days, it didn't happen. We'd have food at the ground, make sure you had a proper meal. Uh, individual training programs. He worked with me. Uh, on, on turning on my right side because he felt I had a weakness there. Uh, so absolutely, absolutely wonderful experience. Uh, and I, I was sad to leave really, but I, I got injured and 
a lad called Mal Donachy uh, yeah. came into the left back role. Mal, who was a Northern Ireland international, played in World Cups, went on to play for Manchester United. Yeah. So I lost my place to him for about three months, and I just thought I need games, and so I I, I went to Charlton then. Okay, Charlton. Just just reading back about um, your Wikipedia and some details and stuff about you saying about drinking at, at Luton. Your younger days was that sort of a lot of time on your hands, and were you involved in the you know going out with with teammates? Yeah, look, that when, growing up growing like, up in Newport, I think I touched on it with you, Scott. That I had one ambition. I wanted to emulate my brother, and so growing up. I never touched a drop of alcohol till I was 18, maybe nearly 19. Never, never touched it. Never touched it because I felt that it wasn't for me. Yeah. If I wanted to achieve what I wanted to achieve. So I never touched a drop. And I used to get almighty stick from my mates and all that. Have a drink. What's the matter with you? Bah, 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 bah. No, 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 I'm not drinking. And then I went to Luton, uh, become a first team regular. With that becomes other things, you know. You get a Wednesday off, the boys are meeting up and a boozer, blah, 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 blah. So I started drinking, started drinking. And then uh, really that didn't stop until 20, 25, 30 years later. Right. Uh, yeah, 25. So, but I'd never, I'd never, after a Wednesday, I'd never drink. Yeah. Never drink until late on in my career when I was about 34. But, you know, I'd have a drink, but sometimes... I'd, I'd, I'd go out on a, this was towards the end, uh, when I was at Cardiff in particular in Bristol City. We'd have a game on a Saturday and I'd, I'd pitch back, back back up at home on a Thursday, you know what I mean? Uh, and in the meantime, but I was always a good trainer. I was, I never, one of the problems I had, and I look back on it, it was a problem, I never had a hangover ever. So I could get lashed and then go and train like a, like a dog the next day. So yeah. I always trained. Uh, and I was a, I was always a good trainer, so nobody knew only me. Right. Okay. Yeah. Did you think it was obviously at the time you, you probably didn't think it was a problem? You just no, it was a culture. It's, it, culture. Listen, yeah. it, it still exists a little bit today, not so much because of the, the the influx of foreign players who brought a different mentality. But when I went to Charlton, for instance, my first day uh, training uh, after training, there was. Uh, a lad called Derek Brazil, Steve Grit, who went on the manager club, Alan Kirbishley. Yeah. Oh, we're going to a local boozer. Are you coming, A's? And you at the new club, you know, it's like, yeah, of course I am. You know? So they laid down, down the rules then that uh, you never train on a Monday. You've always got to strain because the physio used to give you half hour treatment and let you go home. So you go to the boozer uh, and stuff like that. And then we had a, when I, when I was at Leeds, with people like John Sheridan, who was a big, big drinker. That was a big drinking culture when I was at Leeds. We had what they call a six by six squad. Uh, uh, so, you know, the match finishes, 20, used to finish, kick off at three o'clock, finish 20 to five. By the time you'd had your team talk, manager, give you a bit of a rollick, you know, wherever, you know, you got a shower, you're in the players' lounge, it was all free by about quarter past, 20 past five. You had to have six points by six o'clock. Uh, before you go back on a bus, you know what I mean? So it was a cultural thing and it was it was just part and parcel. Yeah. But I wouldn't say we were less fit than the players today. I have to be honest with you. If you look at times back then for, for bleep tests and different things like that and levels, they're on a par with what they do today. Well, you look at, you just watched the Man United documentary about, you know, Ron Atkinson and, and Gordon Strachan was saying, you know, you can say what you like, but you've got uh, camaraderie, You've got togetherness in the dressing room, going out in the middle of the week. You know, yes, it can have an, an adverse effect, but it can also bring you together. Liverpool's European sides, Sunus and Dalglish and all those. Really? So, you know, I, I'm I'm obviously at an age where now you're supposed to be doing the right things, and like you said about periodization, but there's still room for some camaraderie, and at the right times, there's still room for bonding and, and things like that. Probably not as yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think the culture today with the players is, especially at the highest level, I don't think they socialise together. No, it's all. I don't think they, they're, they're individuals. Uh, they, they don't talk to the manager. If they have a problem, they go on their, on their Twitter or their Instagram or their agent talks to the chief executive or the chairman. And I think that it, it's, it, it's different now. I don't think players of today's ilk socialise together. I don't think they actually know each other. You know, the, the thing about what, what struck me when Leicester won the title was that they were all around Vardy's house. And I thought, 
that's probably why it's got more points and one of the reasons, you know, is it, it was a contributing factor. Yes, they had good players. Yes, they had this. Yes, they had that. But one of the contributing factors why Leicester could win the league was the fact what you saw when they were around watching a game in Vardy's house, that they had a bit of togetherness. Those people have come through. Yes, yeah. you manager and stuff, but the core of that is still there. And that's why they won the, um, won the yeah. Cup, you know, definitely. You, 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 you wouldn't see that these days. You wouldn't see that. Uh, and, and whether that's for the better or worse remains to be seen. But to be fair, uh, I enjoyed my time. You know, I had a, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful life as a footballer. I've had a wonderful life, full stop. Forget about any hardships that may have come my way. Uh, I've had a wonderful life and I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah, absolutely. And coming on to that now, if you look at Leeds, must have been some big characters there. It must have been a... You know, uh, number one, it must have been great to, to go and sign for Leeds and get that, that phone call of, look, Leeds are interested. Did you yeah, were well, aware of it or was it a, a sudden thing? Was it one of those? You no, know, well, I was, I was captain of Charlton. I was happy. I was content. I was at my, my daughter was going to school in London. I loved London. Uh, but growing up as a kid in Newport, uh, and it's not, not so much now, but buses used to go from Newport to Allen Road every week. It like was a Leeds United supporters club. Leeds were massive in Wales. Yeah. You know, Billy Bremner's in that era, yeah? And Billy Bremner was, I, I used to like, although he was like little and ginger, I used to pretend to be Billy Bremner on the, on the games. And so even then as an adult, you know, I was, I was, a, I was a international footballer by now. Lenny Lawrence pulled me in and said, look, A's, uh, the club have accepted a bid for you of 250 grand, uh, which was... Doesn't sound a lot today, but the oh, world like record that. was only a million at the time. Uh, and, you know, I don't want you to go, but do you want to talk to them? And I went, well, the thing is, Len, I said, Billy Bremner's manager. I said, and I've, he's my hero. He was my hero as a kid. So I don't want to go. I'm happy, but let me just go and have a chat with him so I can meet him. And so anyway, so what you don't realise at the time, Scott, and I don't know if you've, you've ever been in this position, when you're going to sign for a club like Leeds, they offer you money. If you say no, they just offer you more money. And you say no, and they offer you more money. And you don't leave until you say yes. I didn't know that at the time. So in the end, it just become embarrassing. Yeah. And I just had to say yes. And then I remember Lenny on saying to me, I thought you weren't going to sign. I went, well, thank you, Gaffer. They blah, blah, blah. He went, oh, I just signed as well. <laughs> uh, and what I would say about Billy, God rest his soul, is that in terms of man management, yeah, you'd run through a brick wall for him in terms of tactician and Bauer didn't have a clue. Right. We played five a side football every single day, irrespective of the result the week before, irrespective of who we were playing, we had a five a side because Billy was the best player. And in terms of man management, uh, absolutely wonderful. And, and although he was my hero as a kid, Sometimes I think in life, Scott, you meet you meet your heroes and you can be disappointed. Yeah. Billy Bremner never disappointed me for one day, yeah. you know. And then eventually he got the sack, and then he got Howard Wilkinson come in, who was totally opposite. I wouldn't run a, yeah. I wouldn't run through a paper bag for Howard Wilkinson because he was a complete and a, a knob. <laughs> yeah, excuse my friends, but tactician, very good. Yeah, preparation, ba 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 ba. Hundred, but absolutely wonderful. So between the two, Billy Bremner and Howard Wilkinson is your perfect manager. But I don't know if that exists. In that dressing room, who were the characters? Who were the, the big names? At that John time? Sheridan. John Sheridan, who, who's gone on to be a manager. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, Gordon Strachan came in. He yeah. signed in for Man United. Gordon. He signed. Uh, he signed Vinny. Uh, yeah. Vinny Jones. Uh, and you know that's that's another story with Vinny. Uh, but it was, it was, I think we had, we were in a championship at the time, but I think we had nine or 10 international footballers in the dressing room. Uh, yeah. And I just, I fell out with Howard Wilkinson, the first meeting I had with him, uh, because he called me to his office on the very first day and said, you're my captain. I want you to be my captain. I know all about you, uh, but you need to understand this. Uh, if... See that John Sheridan, he said, see if he, because he was a big drinker, so he says, he said, see if he comes in in the morning, skipper, smelling a drink, you've got to tell me. 
So I just sat there and I said, Howard, I ain't a grass. Let the little ginger rat be your captain. Right. And I was finished then. I didn't play, I think I did. That. And then I said to my missus, my missus and my young daughter at the time, she's 37 now, they always used to come to Allen Road and watch the games, yeah? And we were playing Warsaw at home, I think, on the Saturday. And I said to my missus, don't come to the game. So she said, why? I went, just don't come. I don't want you at the game. Anyway, cut a long story short, playing the game, I wanted out now. Billy was my hero. They sacked him. Eld Wilkinson wanted me to be a grass. One gun at me. Uh, and I think a right back, it might even be Mel Sterland or somewhere like that, yeah. went down the right. And I never in my whole career, unlike you, ran into the box for a cross. I was always holding. Uh, and for some reason, I ran into the box. Don't know why to this day. Mel Sterling crossed it. I headed it in, in front of the, the cop. Uh, and before that, they'd been giving me a bit of stick. Uh, and then they all started cheering. So this is, this is available on YouTube, this. So then I got back the halfway and I just started flashing these to all the crowd. And I took my armband off and I stamped on it on the floor because right. I wanted out. I did, read, and, uh, I did read a little bit about that, the, the V sign and... Uh, yeah. Uh, was, but it was, was pre uh, pre-planned by me. It was pre-planned by me. And uh, Edward Wilkinson said, sit next to me. I said, I ain't sitting next to you. I'll smash your face in. <laughs> and I just walked off and I never played another game for the club. Right. Yeah. I had death threats and everything, but... Did you? And so that's why, to, even to this day, and I'm talking, that's what, 40 years ago, 40 odd Leeds supporters hate my guts. But it was pre-planned by me. Uh, and I think I ended up going to, to Bradford then, which I didn't, mean, I didn't have to move house. My daughter didn't have to move schools. Teddy Odoff was manager. He was my Welsh international manager as well. So it was familiar. Okay. Good stuff on that, that Leeds one. Leeds, in terms of the players, what team did you play for where the group of players was just was there? Uh, in terms of ability, ability is. it would have to be the Leeds team, but in terms yeah. of togetherness, in terms of team spirit, in terms of never say die attitude, in terms of getting the very best out of every individual within the squad, it would be Charlton when we, when we, when we, I think we, we finished second to Wimbledon and we went up to the, to what is now the Premiership under Lenny Lawrence. That team should never have got promoted because we didn't have an awful lot of quality, but we had a bit of balls about us. We had a bit of, you know, stick together. We were never, I think we, I think that season, I think we came from losing positions about nine times or something like that. Uh, and so that was, that was one of the happiest times for me because the football was great. The group was great. Uh, family was great. And I, I went to Leeds from there, you know, but that, that, that team would, would, you would back them against anybody. And they stayed up. They stayed up the following year in the, in the Premiership. Good. So you've got, you've talked about your togetherness, the players there. When did you hit the Wales scene? When did you first start getting noticed for Wales? Uh, I'd been a pro. I, 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 I can't remember, to be honest. I can't remember the exact details, but I think I was at Luton. So yeah. I must have been 18, 19. Yeah. And, uh, and I make no bones about it. Wales were playing let's just say Sweden for, for the hell of it, yeah? Uh, and they were flying out of Heathrow and I knew they had, uh, and I played 60 games in the league now as an 18, 19 year old, you know? Uh, and I make no bones about it. The only reason I got picked for this squad was the fact that people had dropped out and I lived close to Heathrow because I lived in Luton. Uh, but I got in that squad and I never, never missed a squad again. But the only reason I got picked originally was because they needed a replacement on training camp. And who can we get here? We're flying in three hours. Oh, the, the lad who plays for Luton. That's, that's what happened. Nobody's ever told me that, but I know that, really. Uh, but then you have to make the best of, you know, somebody else, somebody's misfortune is your fortune. And I never missed a squad then. I think I was in the squad now then for the next 10, 11, 12 years, whatever. That's great. You got the opportunity. Things happen for a reason. And you took the opportunity, to, yeah. you know, by the looks of it. Yeah. You know, and so, uh, you know, my job, my job really with Wales was to, to, to stop those people who thought they could play. That was my job with Wales because when he got, 
you know, your rushes, your Mark Hughes, Kevin Ratcliffe at the time was quality. Uh, you know, your Dean Saunders, your Ryan Giggs, these, these type of people. Speed. Uh, I saw a photo, I saw a photo last week and I saw the, the squad that you were actually in. And it was just like, you know, you could point to, I could name probably nearly all of those players from the... Yeah, you know, you know, so my job really was, you know, uh, uh, for want of a better word, an enforcer. Terry Off used to say to me, uh, he's your man, if he gets a shot, if he gets a head, if he gets it, blah, 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 it's your fault. Don't be looking around to anybody else. He said, and when you get the ball, give it to somebody in red. It was simple instruction, but it, it was, it was, it, you, the, the game is sometimes complicated by coaches. It's a simple game. It's a simple game. If, I'm, if I've got number five on my back and there's a number nine, I stop him scoring. And, you know, sometimes it can be a very simplistic game. I remember once, mind, we were, we were playing Germany away and, uh, I was close to Terry because I was playing for Bradford now and we, we used to have a few points together. And, and so we, we were close and uh, I was sat in the dressing room and this is, you can't say this to many players, but I, 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 I have a strength of character that so, sometimes gets me into trouble, but sometimes serves me well. And I remember sat there in the dressing room and I wasn't one of these that used to go around shouting and screaming. I just sit there, have a cup of tea, read the program, the buzzer would go, and then my head would be on it. And I was sat there reading a program away in Germany, a World Cup qualifier. And Terry Olive have come up to me and he sat next to me and he went, he's up front for these. He said, they, uh, they got Klinsmann, they got Voller. I went, yeah. He went, do yourself a favor, get somebody else to mark them. <laughs> and I said to him, no, 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 I'm taking Klinsmann, right? And uh, Anyway, so that, that game, and then the next game when we played the return match was when Russia scored and we beat them 1-0. Yeah. And they'll never see this, but I, play, I played an absolutely astronomical goal, although I don't touch the ball, right? Because what I used to do for international matches, I wouldn't shave for about 10 days before the games. And then what I'd do, I'd put all Vaseline on my face and all over my eyebrows, and I'd look like a complete lunatic, yeah? So... Where I'm stood on the, and this is the only time I'm stood on it, it was the Arms Park as such, and we had a corner. And in the summer prior to this game, I'd watched Germany win the World Cup. Yeah. So it was a it was sunny. It was a, I think it was a it was a European qualifier, it was, and we had a corner. And I'm on the halfway line again, and stood in front of me is Jurgen Klinsmann, right? Now, he was beautiful. Long blonde hair. Suntan. I looked down at him, right? And he had like World Cup winner on his boots, had his ass boots. And for and I looked at my boots, I had high tech boots on with the laces tight all uh, anyway. And for the only time in my career, I thought, what am I doing here on this pitch with these type of people? And it lasted for a split second. And so what I decided to do was butt him, right? So they only had one camera in them days, right? So I butted him on the back of the head, right? And he'd look around and he saw me with all this Vaseline and all this. And, I, and he went, you crazy man. I went, yeah, I'm nuts. I said, you come near me, I'm going to kill you. Okay. Right? So anyway, it's nil-nil, 70 minutes. They clear the ball, Germany, right? And it falls over the midfield, but it falls between me and Klinsmann. Now he's about 60-40 favourite, right? And he goes, whoa, and he goes into reverse to nutter. So I tap the ball to Paul Bowden, who then puts it over the top oh, of the defense oh, and turns it the ball and Rushy scores. But, and then I thought to myself, that's my job. And I never, ever doubted myself ever again. I had a moment of self-doubt when I went, what am I doing on a pitch with this guy? He's a World Cup winner. And then I thought, revert the type, so I butted him. And that, people don't understand, that got us the goal. And there's, there's a model in that. You have to do what you're good at. Absolutely. No, it's, uh, you must have come across some fantastic players at that time. You just mentioned a few there, but any other ones that you come across which were just... Yeah, listen, I, 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 I man Matt Rude Hullet in Holland, yeah? Oh, yeah. And I tried everything. I butted him, stood on his Achilles, pinching him, everything, and he just went, ah, you want it like that, big man, yeah? He battered me. 
physically. He's a big lad as well, isn't he? You know, oh, he's, 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 but what a player. Yeah. What a player. He was he was perhaps the best, I think, because what I found, probably still the same today, but the defenders are different. You could scare international centre forwards in them days. Yeah, but you couldn't scare Rudolph, mate. Mm. And they took him off with about after about 70 minutes, and I thought, thank God for that. And I have a guess who they put on. Marco Van Basten. Oh. <laughs> then you know you're in trouble. 